We are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us. Talking some politics, budget, the debt ceiling, and how things are going this morning with uh, our political science expert extraordinaire from MTSU, Professor John Vile. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for joining. And we can uh, take some phone Good calls. 737-7587 as folks watch this playing out. I'm just wondering, okay, so how big a role behind all of this dispute I mean, politics is at the heart of all of this, with Republicans saying, look, we don't want to be on the hook for so much spending because, you know, our constituents are not big fans of this, whereas uh, Democrats saying, look, we promised all of this infrastructure improvement. Oh, how big a role does politics play? And is, is there truly, you think, for all of these lawmakers, a filter, including the president, by which they go through with this as they think about upcoming elections? Yes, it's, I mean, it's very political. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, we've entrusted the legislative branch, as we said earlier, with the power of the purse, and we're supposed to be able to hold them accountable. One of the difficulties is when issues get as complicated as this, it's hard to know exactly, you know, who the, who, who the people are in the white hats and who are the ones in, in the black hats. Uh, there's so much behind the scene negotiating, and then you know, then you also have, you know, how much is the responsibility of the president? How much is the responsibility of Congress? So let's see. I mean, and we talk about them is whenever we get into any of these discussions, it's amazing to me that anything ultimately gets done. And I have no doubt the debt ceiling at some point is going to be raised. But I mean, uh, do you see right now the way things stand? It's as divisive as ever. Or is there any chance Mitch McConnell is going to sit down and hash things out with President Biden? I mean, you know, I mean, will they even listen to each other? Well, again, there's a workaround, in my understanding, for the debt ceiling in which no Republicans would, would have to agree to it. Um, they would suspend the filibuster uh, for that. Um, it's hard to know. You, you know, your, what you see in public posturing may or may not be what's also happening behind the scenes. The, you know, the great irony of the situation right now is of all the presidents we've had in the last 50 years, Joe Biden has had the greatest experience within Congress of any of them. Right. Now, you know, he's been out for 12 years, uh, but you would think that if anyone would have some insight into how this process works and, you know, would be familiar with all the actors and sort of what, the, what they want, that it, that it would be Biden. So uh, I hold out a little hope there that, you know, ultimately that expertise might, might pay off in this situation, but it's certainly a messy one. Yeah, and I don't know, is it part of the thing, you're right about that, is that we all know how old Joe Biden is. I mean, he's up there, and there is it just that, you know, a lot of the, you know, contacts and relationships he had <laughs> there are still some there of course but i mean are not there anymore and it's just so many new younger lawmakers is that part of the problem well in terms of the senate they live forever so yeah. <laughs> most of them that he knew are still there uh the house is a little bit different you, you know matter you know one of the one of the things that biden has to be conscious of we we're talking about elections almost always in the off-year election, so two years after the presidential election, which will be next year, almost always the president's party loses, uh, particularly in the House of Representatives. And as you've pointed out, you know, the margin is so, so close in the Senate that even if there, you know, even if there weren't a major shift there, just, just a seat or two uh, could make a real difference. So part of what's happening, I'm, I think, especially with the, you know, the one and a half trillion and the three and a half trillion bills, is if they are, if they don't get through this time, they're probably not going to get through, you know, at least at least for another year and possibly through the end of the administration. Okay, right. So it's kind of like now or never in some regard with the way it kind of looks. Yes. And again, um, just kind of walk us through a bit of, uh, that's an awful lot of money we're talking about, but infrastructure, he says, is so important. In, in Biden's mind and his plan is to spend this money and the Democrats who support it because this country is long overdue for a lot of major, and when we talk infrastructure, we're talking roads, bridges. Is that right. basically what we're talking about, a huge overhaul of areas that really need it now, in, in their opinion. Well, that's the first bill. That that's the one that there's 
much more agreement on, you know, you have, I think, 10 senators or so that are, that are Republicans who have basically said if this bill is by itself, they're going to support it. Uh, the more complicated is the $3.5 trillion, where, again, uh, Senator Manchin has said, well, he's not going to go any higher than two. Uh, wouldn't you like to have a mono- wouldn't you like to have a monopoly game where you're you're right. dealing with yeah right. two trillion here you, you, you know uh, Everett Dirksen used to say a billion here a billion there you're eventually talking about real money now we're throwing around terms of, of trillion here and trillion there. You know while all of this is going on in the back and forth I just wanted to get your thoughts you know. We saw when President Trump was in office, except near the very end there and into the campaign, you don't hear a whole lot from former President Obama, okay? And I think you've, you've said and told me in the past the tradition is that, you know, former presidents say typically, even if they don't agree, rarely if ever will speak out against the, 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 the new president. And, and it seems like in some large uh, measure that's applied with uh, former President Trump. I mean, we, we still hear from him on occasion, but I've got to admit, I've even been a little bit surprised at just how much he's kind of kept back in the background. And I, I'm not exactly sure how to read that. How do you think? Because if anything, tradition doesn't matter much to this president, pre- former President Trump. He'll do as he thinks is right, regardless, as we saw during presidency. But he hasn't said a whole lot. He hasn't really attacked President Biden all that much, one way or the other. Well, what, he, what do you think? Well, I think he's actually been excluded from some of the online platforms that he has, from Tweet and the like. Uh, and he, he was actually filing a suit, if I remember, within That's the last true. week or two. Yep. asking to be reinstated. He is still doing rallies. Right. Um, I think he's as visible as, you know, maybe you'd have to go back to Grover Cleveland. <laughs> he's one of those, he's the only individual who served two non-successive terms. <clears throat> he actually won the popular vote in all three elections, but in the second election, he lost the electoral college. Uh, but you have to go f- that far back before you have probably a candidate, you know, who had previously been president, who really had a good shot at, you know, at least getting the nomination and possibly becoming president again. OK, so and he, he has not said definitively, has he, um, former President Trump, what his plans are for the next presidential election? I, I think most signs seem to be pointing to the fact that he, he does plan to run. That he would try um, it again. And, and, what, and what is the, yes. how do you think the Republican Party is viewing that as a whole? Because we certainly know there are many other Republicans ready to jump into the fray. And he, he doesn't automatically get it like he did as the incumbent. I mean, he'll have to go through a primary and everything, would he not? And, and we don't know how that will play out. I don't know what his chances would be one way or the other. But, I mean, as a party as a whole, would he, you know, he could even break off and run on his own, couldn't he? He could. In my judgment, the Republican Party should ditch him, but that's that's simply a personal judgment. Uh, he will, you know, he's one of those candidates who stirs great emotions on both sides. Uh, he will have a very strong, passionate base, which may, you know, we need to remember neither election did Trump actually capture a majority of the popular vote. And he lost fairly substantially in the electoral vote uh, last time. You know, partly, uh, partly this will depend on some ongoing investigations, both of his own, you know, his own personal, you know, use of monies, investigations that are going on there, but also the continuing investigation of the of the Capitol Hill riot uh, on January six, and there could be, you know. If you'll notice, it, it, of course, every administration you have people once it's over who who you know start start telling writing tell all books. But we've had more tell all books in the last even oh, yeah. three or four weeks or months than we typically have for an entire presidency. So there's prop you know one never quite he he seems relatively immune. You know they used to call. Reagan, the Teflon president, but in many ways, Trump was the Teflon president as well. Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. There have been so many. I, could, I think there's another book that just came out this week, and 
Yes. They kind of all blur together at one point. My interest yes, is do. this. I mean, we, we've kind of heard it, and I think we all probably expected that something like this would happen. I, I'm just intrigued, too, by the way. Don't you have to sign some kind of non-disclosure a lot of times if you're within the you know, inner circle of the presidency, or does that not really exist? You know, I'm not an expert enough yeah. to know on that. I believe that the Trump, I guess part of it is how exactly do you enforce it if, you know, if, if somebody breaches it? And, you know, um, when we and, and of course, yeah. Yeah. go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, we also, when you get to the Woodward Costa book, that's by outsiders. Yes. Uh, you know, have had pretty good access to, to individuals, and it'd be pretty hard in some cases to figure out even which individuals told them. So even if they had made such an agreement, might not might not be able to track the, the source. And who else do you think will run in the Republican Party? You know, Trump probably going to run, but who will who will challenge him? You know, <laughs> I'd like to see Liz Cheney do it. I think that would be a would be a fun race, but I think she'd have, you know she'd she'd have trouble at the national level among Republicans, probably becoming dog catcher right now. <laughs> um, you know, governors are governors are always you know DeSantis, uh, Rubio, Senator Rubio, um, Mickey Haley. I notice is. You know, yeah. sort of trying to straddle the fence, sort of a mugwomp here, as, as she's done before. Uh, I guess they would be some of the prominent names right now. You know, the other thing to remember, though, is at at Biden's age, it's not altogether certain that he will be running again. Right. Um, and and you, that would open up, you know, and even well, it, just as controversial uh, nomination because. Clearly, the party right now is sort of split between the moderates uh, and your, you know, the so-called progressive wing. Uh, and it's, it's not altogether clear, you know, that one of the frustrations, I think, for some voters is they thought when they were voting for Biden that they were really getting a moderate, say, as opposed to the Bernie Sanders or, you know, even Elizabeth Warren. And yet a good number of his policies seem to have leaned in a more progressive uh, direction. So... Hard to know where, where that will go. Yeah, the decision, he, he'll, he'll be the one that makes that decision, I assume. And I, I'm wondering if it's just, uh, you would think at where he sits right now, as long as his health and he feels like he can physically continue, he would do it. But if he made that call, what would you think it would basically only be because he feels physically or perhaps mentally he's just not up to snuff anymore? I would think so. I mean, I, you know, you, you don't run for president without a fair amount of ambition and i think you know i think in his case he really believed uh, believes that you know if someone if it hadn't been a moderate opposing trump that trump might have won again and i think in in biden's book that really would have been a disaster for the country so i you know partly you remember his his son had encouraged him to run and he he didn't four years earlier but this time he did uh, i think he has a real com you know commitment to you know what he believes in but again a lot a lot depends on his health um and of course at the moment he's not particularly popular uh we elected biden largely i think be partly because he wasn't trump and partly because it was thought that he was highly competent and we had just a disastrous exit from from afghanistan yeah might have been as bad under under donald trump but you know what didn't happen under donald trump it happened on biden's watch We'll talk more about that, and we're going to take some phone calls. Uh, our guest uh, with us this morning, Professor John Vile. When we come back, Taylor and others. Taylor, stay right there. We'll get to you as soon as we come back from this break.